Aye. Okay. Uh, greetings, greetings, everyone. Once again, you're on with the Woodson Banneker Jackson Bay Division 330, UNIA ACL RC 2020. And this is our Freedom Friday Forum for July 8, 2022. And we have a, a guest presenter who I'm sure you will be glad that you didn't miss him when you hear him because he's we're going to be talking about his new book what's up chief pacifica black and this book uh, it's chock full of information chock full of history chock full of the kind of stuff all black people need to know when it comes to the pacific so we're going to start but you know, we got to do our normal rituals, which begins with our UNIA pledge to the flag. All right, uh, let me recite for you. I commit my body, mind, and spirit to the protection, defense, and security of the red, black, and green. I dedicate my life to the redemption of Mother Africa and the liberation of her scattered black children. I accept for myself and my descendants the teachings of universal African nationalism. And I promise that our children will be instilled with the purpose and knowledge of themselves as African people in order that the cause of our struggle will neither falter nor fail until all black people are free and united through one God, one aim, one destiny. Of course, I can't leave, just leave it there because I know uh, Professor Q would like to hear the other part that I'm going to be doing, which is the preamble of the Constitution. You're on mute, Baba. You're on mute, Baba. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I got to stay away from my keyboard. OK. Um, as I was saying, uh, you know, Dr. Tito Swan is very familiar with the, con the, the Constitution of the UNIA. And uh, I'm saying that because when you read his book, you will understand <laughs> that uh, he made himself very familiar before he got into all this stuff that he wrote there. It's a lot of chock full of stuff. But here we go. The preamble of the Uni Constitution of the UNIA ACL, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League is a social, friendly, humanitarian, charitable, educational, institutional, constructive and expansive society, and is founded by persons desiring to the utmost to work for the general uplift of the Negro peoples of the world. And the members pledge themselves to do all in their power to conserve the rights of their noble race and to respect the rights of all mankind. Believing always in the brotherhood of man, and the fatherhood of God. The motto of the organization is one God, one aim, one destiny. Therefore, let justice be done to all mankind, realizing that if the strong oppresses the weak, confusion and discontent will ever mark the path of man. But with love, faith, and charity towards all, the reign of peace and plenty will be heralded into the world and the generations of men shall be called blessed. So you see, we have a very ambitious organization. <laughs> Generations of men shall be called blessed. All right. Uh, that was the preamble to the Constitution. And uh, uh, before I, I say anything else, let me reintroduce myself. I am Baba Mosi Matsimilo, president of the Woodson Banneker Jackson Bay Division of the UNIA ACL. Division 330, RC 2020, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, my co-host is Baba Congo Africa, Vice President of the Division 330 here in UNI, here in Washington, D.C. And uh, our guest this evening is Dr. Kito Swan. Dr. Kito Swan, who used to be in this neighborhood, I think for quite some time, 
and I'll let him, you know, g g give us a little, because I'm going to ask him a little bit about himself and the background, give us a little background. I don't want to talk too much because I was surprised he wasn't here. <laughs> yes, Dr. Swan, Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies at the Indiana University Bloomington. And he's the author of this book. Let me show you it again. Pacific of Black. And we're going to discuss it here this evening. Oceania, Anti-Colonialism, and the African World. Of course, you might have seen something a little different on our flyer, which uh, is saying that we it's about countering the Eurocent trick <laughs> denial. <laughs> Uh, of those other folks. You know what I'm talking about? All right. So, uh, Dr. Swan, welcome. Welcome Thank you. to Freedom Friday Forum. And uh, we'd be glad to see you. Thank, mean, thank you. Thank it's you, It's been Paul. a while. It's been, it's and, been too uh, long. The last time you were with us, you were live and in person. <laughs> So uh, and now I suppose you're in Bloomington at this moment, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, you've uh, you you we we're going to be discussing this this book of yours tonight, and I'm sure there's going to be other than that. I mean, uh, it's it's got I I I assume it's got it's not assume. I mean, I've looked at it. I've gone through it as much as I could. It's 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 a it's a tome. I mean. It, 300 odd pages and everyone should have it. Let me show it to you again, because if you want knowledge of the Oceania, the peoples of the Pacific, the African peoples of the Pacific, they have claimed it, you must read this book. I think uh, Dr. Swan is the premier expert coming from the African side of things on this particular area of study. And uh, I'm gonna ask him to start wherever he wants to when it comes to presenting uh, to us tonight. So Dr. Swan, the floor is yours and that uh, you, you know, go from wherever you want. Uh, once again, thank you, Barbara. I, I look forward to a, a great conversation, um, questions, exchange with, with the community. Um, while I do, I do stand, stand on my research and stand by it, uh, I'll talk tonight about how I think I'm really part of a tradition of Black people across the world who have looked at the Pacific or Oceania as part of the Black world. Um, and so a lot of what I say may come across as new, but from my perspective, I think I'm really been trying to just tap into a, a broader tradition and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I'm born and raised in from in Bermuda, which is remains a British colony um, in the Caribbean. Uh, I went to Florida a and University for undergrad, studied computer science, was very fascinated by just the idea of a black world decided to study the black world the African diaspora at a black institution at the time Howard had the only PhD in African diaspora history. I love DC because of its black communities and so I did my PhD work at Howard. Uh, my thesis was on the UNIA in Bermuda. Um, so for me this is a home this is homecoming. Uh, that could be a whole nother discussion. <laughs> but the Black yeah. Star Line was really critical in the island. Um, mm -hmm. And I part of the, the, the points of that work was to show, you know, that the Black Star Line's practical, um, practical, you know, form of help for the Black world was, was what attracted a lot of Black Bermudians to the UNIA, a lot of, a lot of sailors, uh, you know, a lot of shipmen, a lot of captains who had actually joined the Black Star Line before Bermuda even had its own division. From there, I connected that part of the Black radical tradition to the Black power movement in Bermuda, which culminated in the assassination of British governor in the mid 1970s. Um, one of the key participants in the Black power movement 
is known as Roosevelt Brown, but also he took the name Paolo Cameron Cafego. He was a leading internationalist black power advocate who ended up in Oceania, working with black power movements in Australia and liberation struggles in places like Papua New Guinea, well, Wanawatu, more, more, more explicitly. And so it was his work, his tradition that, that actually led me to write Pacifica Black because the second book that I'll mention was about his global travels. And there's a few chapters in there about Oceania as well. Um, this book is really about Oceania, but I, I'll explain that, you know, as I share my screen, some slides, just wanted to give some background. Um, you know, I didn't just fall from the sky in the Pacific <laughs> one day, you know, on a wave. This was part of a, a, a long standing process to understand how the black world, we've collectively seen each other uh, and, and fought fought together. And I'm, I'm pretty clear that for me, when I look at Oceania, it's not simply about confirming what we already know. The question for me is also, does the black presence in Oceania challenge some of the things that we know? What is it that we need to learn as a black world from liberation struggles in Oceania? And, and, what, and what, are the, what are the complications? Um, so a lot of times I found myself being left even with more questions than answers. Um, and I think, I think that's okay. But enough of that, let me, let me jump to the screen. I know you all don't wanna see my face for too long. So um, <laughs> I know I say that, you're all right. I do have some audio. Hopefully that will, that will pipe through okay. as well. Can we all see that? Yes. Okay. Now I know this is a really informed audience. So I'm sure if I was to ask a question, uh, you know, where is this picture from? Uh, pretty sure I'll get, you know, a good answer, but I'll ask it anyway. What does this picture look like? Actually, that's maybe a different question, but what does this picture look like? Um, and uh, when I've asked, yo. Straight out of Uganda, man. Could be Uganda, right, indeed. <laughs> The, it looks southern. Looks southern. Yeah. Right. When you say southern, southern as in U.S. U.S. southern is exactly yeah. right. It could be U.S. southern. This is actually um, from a place in Queensland, Australia, Ooh. in the 19th century. This sugarcane plantation. Um, the laborers there were forcibly taken from. Uh, what's now Wanawatu or the islands of Wanawatu, and they were forcibly taken uh, work sugarcane throughout the 19th century in a trade, illicit trade known as blackbirding. And some 60,000 Melanesians were taken to work on cotton and sugar plantations in Australia and also in Fiji by Australian European traders, also US Southern Confederates. Um, who moved some of the operations in cotton to Australia after the Civil War. Um, now this community is known as the South Sea Islanders. So it's another South, so to speak. Um, and the descendants were very much involved in other Black political struggles in Oceania and Australia. But this also speaks to an interesting dynamic that while we may look at Australia as from afar as a place of quote unquote, indigenous Aborigines, there are other versions of blackness in Australia too. Um, like the South Sea Islanders, like the Torres Strait Islanders who occupy the Northern part of Australia historically and were closer to, culturally closer to Papua New Guinea. But it's these kind of moments or these kind of engagements that intrigue uh, me as I wrote Pacifica Black, which, as I mentioned, it stems from my second book on Paolo Cameron Cafego, who was an environmental justice activist and his Black International Spend the World. Uh, much of my attention is around an area known as Melanesia. It's called Melanesia because when European explorers across the 15th, 16th centuries went there, uh, they were struck by the 
the dark complexions of indigenous peoples. And they named the area Melanesia as in melanin, uh, New Guinea as in old Guinea being Africa, New Guinea being this region. Many of these names carry European names. Many, many of these spaces carry European names like New Caledonia, that's, that's really uh, the Caledonians in Scotland, so to speak. And while we're familiar with these images, I'm sure, once again, this is an informed community. I'm sure we've seen pictures of indigenous persons and from the region, for example, this is a photograph of 19th century Fiji, a uh, person with a, a pick, an Afro, we would probably say phenotypically, this person looks like folks in our own community. For me, that's the starting point. Um, you know, not, not, not the end question, that's the beginning. For me, I was trying to really ask questions of if these communities were racialized and colonized as being black, how did these communities identify as being black? How did they use blackness in their own liberation struggles? Uh, how were we connected to a broader political struggle, cultural struggle, as opposed to just saying, hey, we look alike? I think that's important, but that's not the entire story. Uh, what are some of the specific intentional ways that Black communities in Melanesia used the Blackness or transformed the Blackness, identified or rejected the Blackness in an effort to fight against European colonialism. Uh, part of the story is how have the architects of Pan-Africanism, of Black nationalism perceived Oceania as a Black space, historically speaking. Uh, one of my, my methods as, as a scholar is to take us from what we know or what's in plain view and show us what we don't know. This is Bob Marley's Survivor album, 1978. I would probably say it's, it's number one for me. Uh, I, I, I would be fine with losing the debate. Uh, you can't go wrong with Marley. This album cover um, to the untrained eye has 49 flags of African countries. It's a Pan-African album of survival. There's the slave ship, quote unquote. Uh, on the back cover, there's quotes from Garvey, Selassie, uh, anti-colonial words. But there's one flag on this map that is not of Africa. Usually I ask, which flag is it? Um, don't feel compelled to try to answer for the sake of time. Well, Way down have, in the bottom. Bottom as in where? Where, where, where you say bottom? Uh, third from the left. Exactly. And that is, of course, <laughs> the flag of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> yeah. But what this also lets us know is that Marley himself had a, had a vision of, of Melanesia um, when he wrote this album. His, his vision of Black survival included the Pacific. Uh, more specifically, he does a survival tour um, in Australia and New Zealand in the late 1970s, or 1978 rather, in New Zealand, he meets with former Black Panthers. Uh, I should say New Zealand's Polynesian Panthers, which was the Black Panther-like party who had become uh, of the Rasta faith. And it looks like Marley learns about the Black world more through these type of engagements. But this is bigger than Marley. This is, this is, this conversation is, is much older. In, the 19, in 1920, Carter G. Woodson received a letter from a Negro exile in Melbourne, Australia, who asked Woodson to send him uh, copies of the NAACP's Crisis, the African Blood Brotherhood's Crusader, the United Negro World, uh, W. Domingo's Emancipator, and Woodson's Journal of Negro History. A UNIA division, a branch is formed in Sydney with the support of Amy Joss Garvey in 1920. Uh, some of those organizers had befriended Jack Johnson who wins his heavyweight title match in Australia. Um, he was beloved by Aboriginal peoples in Australia. Uh, Jack Johnson mentions in his fight when he looked out and see white faces, he saw one black face and it gave him strength. The British government banned the film from the, or the film of the fight from being shown in the Solomon Islands because they were concerned it might instigate the natives. Uh, Jack Johnson's hanging out with a group called the Colors People Association, 
they throw him parties. Uh, he goes to museums. He talks about the historic, beautiful civilizations that was there before Europeans got there. Meanwhile, this is a moment circa 1904 when Australia is very much defining itself as a white only country. Uh, Australia is defining itself as a country that no people existed there before Europeans showed up. This is right in the constitution. That's not challenged until the 1990s. Um, Garvey himself asked questions like, do they think they're going to exterminate 400 million Negroes, 400 million Blacks, as they have exterminated the North Native American Indians and the Aborigines of New Zealand and Australia? If Black men have no right in America, Australia, Canada, then the white man should have no right in Africa. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but, but the point is there's a consistency in some of the architects of Pan-Africanism, some of the thinkers of the Black world, about Oceania being a space of Blackness. This is a photograph of Merce Tate, the first Black woman to get a PhD in international relations. He taught at Howard University for several decades. Uh, she wrote extensively about Black communities in Oceania. She wrote about Black birding. She published it in Negro journals. She gets Fulbrights and fellowships to travel um, to Hawaii, to India. And she also is one of the teachers of Joseph E. Harris, who also taught at Howard University and founded African diaspora studies as a field at Howard in the 1960s. When Harris founds African diaspora studies, he always has a notion of there is an African diaspora east of Africa. His focus was on Asia, specifically the Arabian Peninsula, the Islamic world. But the point is, for much of the 20th century, the architects, the critical thinkers of the Black world, from uh, Alexander Crummel um, to Morris Tate, understood that there is a notion of a Black Pacific, even if they did not use that language. And for me to erase that provenance is to not approach the topic of a Black Pacific with integrity. My work is part of a broad, long-standing tradition that is not only about historical issues, but also contemporary struggles and contemporary similarities and legacies. For example, this is a photograph of myself in Wanawatu. Uh, as you know, Melanesia was a critical site of World War II. Several African-Americans fought in World War II in the Pacific. Uh, there are tons of stories of connections with indigenous folks, but probably the most visible presence is the US left ships, tanks, weapons, planes, who now stick out of the ocean. Ooh, there's a ton of uh, environmental issues this was I sitting on a, a, a tank. Um, you can imagine what I was thinking about, but I really felt at home because of the black communities that I worked with. So I, I'll proceed from that. So on the one hand, the notion is the, the book is about how is the black world seen Oceania? The other dynamic is how have black people in Oceania identified with the broader black world? And most of the book is an attempt to address that question. Uh, this is a document from early 1950s called The Voice of the Negroids in the Pacific to the Negroids of the World. This is a topic that um, the United Community is quite aware of. This was written by individuals from what is now West Papua who was seeking help from, this is, a, this is an article from the Pittsburgh Courier for 19, I believe maybe 1960, 61, they were seeking help from the Negro brothers and sisters in the fight against Indonesia colonialism. This is one of the most critical chapters in the book. Uh, for me, as we know, the Bangdong Conference is a critical moment of Afro-Asiatic solidarity, and it should be, it should be. Uh, from folks like Malcolm, other thinkers, We've, seen, we've used Bangdong as a critical moment in thinking about Global South 
uh, alliances against European colonialism. But from the Black Pacific perspective, Bangdong also legitimized Indonesia's false claims to West Papua. Uh, Indonesia and West Papua were colonized by the Dutch. Germany had colonized what's now Papua New Guinea. As a matter of fact, this was Germany's first overseas colony. It was Papua New Guinea. This was actually before the Berlin Conference. Uh, so while when we think about the Berlin Conference, we usually see it as the space where Europe carved Africa. It's also a space where Europeans decided who would get what in Oceania. For example, as part of the deal that France, that Britain gives, that France gives Britain Egypt, is that Britain says, France, you can have Tahiti. Uh, and we can share Wanawatu. So even Europeans also saw Oceania and Africa and the Americas as part of a, a big cake to be colonized. That being said, after World War II, uh, Indonesia is given sovereignty. Um, Indonesia claims that West Papua was an ancient land of Indonesia. West Papua has denounced that. Uh, the cries went relatively unanswered, but they got support from the international black world up to an extent. One of the reasons, and, and, they, and these leaders, they traveled through Africa, they traveled to black conferences, uh, this book, their letter sent to Haile Selassie, letter sent to Nkrumah, acting for support against Indonesia. They felt that many African leaders didn't support their fight because they were, and this is a quote, blinded by Bangdong. And for me, that was something really important to think about because like many of us, I've seen Bangdong and, and rallied around Bangdong uh, as a place of Afro-Asian solidarity. But the position of West Papua, uh, you know, forces us to think differently of, and, and challenges that question to some extent. Ironically, the loudest space of support for West Papua came from Leopold Senghor, who we know as an architect of negritude. Uh, we would put him probably on the, 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 the right side of political uh, writers like Amy Cesar, uh, but in the 1970s, he allows the provisional government of West Papua to establish a base in the car. Uh, and, and from the car, uh, the provisional leader, his name was Ben Tagama, use it as a space to connect with the broader black world. So in the mid 1970s, there's a major conference of black writers organized by Willis and Yika in the car, uh, they meet with these leaders. They make these amazing declarations of solidarity. And the names on that list include folks like Sheikh Antajop, CLR James, the quite controversial Carlos Moore, uh, and several other, several other familiar Black writers and thinkers. But once again, in the mid-1970s, the issue of West Papua for some of the critical icons of Black politics, it's a known thing. It's not something that's invisible. For me, I'm just curious about how we go to these moments of historical uh, amnesia to the point that we now have to go back and remember. And I see there's a question from the chat, um, but I can't see the chat. Ah, okay, sorry. All right, let's move on. This is a young Kef Walker, one of the most critical activists um, to come out of Australia, which was a critical site of black power, and black politics. As I mentioned, um, Paolo Camarcafego from Bermuda, is a critical architect of black power and heavily involved in black power movements in Australia. This is a photograph of Paolo a young Patricia Kruger, or Patricia Cora rather, she was a descendant of the communities I mentioned that were black birded to Australia, and a young Bob Mazza. They were leaders of a group called the Aborigines Advancement League. 
and they were aware that Paulu organized the Black Power Conference in Bermuda in 1969, and that he was organizing the Black Power Conference in Barbados for 1970. That was sabotaged. It became the Congress of African Peoples. This takes place in Atlanta in 1970, but it's usually remembered uh, via the lens of Amiri Baraka. Well, this photograph is actually courtesy of Australia's Security Intelligence Organization, also known as ASIO, which would be um, Australia's version of the FBI. They had these Black Power activists under surveillance. Uh, Paulu travels uh, there. This would be summer 1969. And he is not the architect of Black Power in Australia, but his presence reflects that there was a growing movement of Black Power already there. Hopefully this video will play. It was giving me some technical difficulties. Can we hear that? Yes. Great. Okay. Let me just. This is some footage from um, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation about Black movement in Australia. I'll show a really brief clip or two from it. Victory. There should be economic sanctions passed against Australia. This is a young Paul Coe. He was one of the critical leaders of Black other Black Power movement um, in Sydney. One of his many of his inspirations included. The autobiography of Malcolm X, Bamar Hardy Wounded Knee. He was one of the most articulate uh, thinkers on black power. Sure. There should be sporting ties should be severed, cultural ties should be severed. We have got to work towards the ultimate objective and that we are economically, culturally and socially independent. <laughs> Land rights is a means to this. Smashing the Queensland Act is a means to this. Land rights isn't a word, it's a living. Okay, this is Dennis Walker. <clears throat> he is the son of Calf Walker, I just mentioned. Kath Walker was the leader of a group called Fikatsi, the Federal Council for Aboriginal and Australian Torres Strait Islanders. Um, she also was probably the most popular Aboriginal poet. Her son founds Australia's Black Panther Party in 1971. This is him speaking at a land rights conference, which is what Black Power really meant in Australia. It's people. To black people, it's a living. To white people, it's money. And they're gonna kill black people one way or another to get that money. That's what land rights means. That means a lot of money. And it means a lot of people that are getting rich off your blood and guts. How much is that building worth? Millions. One thing I've said here, is that untrue? No! no. That's a police car that he jumped into. When I think of, of Dennis Walker, I think a lot of H. Rap Brown. Um, he had this ability to capture, to use radical imagination, to capture audiences when he spoke. Now, for me, it's, it's important to show this, this kind of footage because, as I stated, uh, the question is no, for me, is no longer, look, there are Black people in these spaces. It's what, the, what are the political experiences of Black people in those spaces? Uh, and I would also say that much of the attention on Black power, for example, is focused on Australia. This is also... Well, Papua New Guinea is a really critical space for Blackness. I would argue that to understand Blackness in Oceania, one has to understand Papua New Guinea. It's probably the most important country to understand what Melanesia means and how uh, 
indigenous communities transform Melanesia from being a really negative imposed term, a racist imposed term of colonialism to a signifier of, of, of black power and black internationalism. This is from the student newspaper at the University of Papua New Guinea, which means one word, Niladat. Uh, it's an article about black power in 1969 or 1970, rather, the New Guinea Black Power Group was founded on the campus of Papua New Guinea, the University of Papua New Guinea, um, by Leo Hannett and a number of, of, of young, young artists from poets, visual artists, sculptors, novelists. They, um, they found themselves at this university, which was founded in 1966 by the British who took over the administration of um, Papua and New Guinea after World War II, and then it was passed on to Australia. The university was founded to create a class of, of middle-class Papua New Guineans who would help usher in you know, uh, Papua New Guinea as an independent country under neo-colonialism. But within a few years, the tractors were calling it a Mau Mau factory. Mama, as in Kenya's Leonard Freedom Army, because of what they perceived as, the, as this immense Black radicalism emanating from the Black Power Group. This is Leo Hannett, who had also traveled to Africa. Um, he wrote extensively in the newspapers. He embraced Black, liberal, uh, black liberation theology. Uh, he wrote about the assassination of King, he identified with Black Power. He and others described the New Guinea Black Power Group as a phenomenon inspired African negritude movement. Uh, they argued that they were not enslaved to Black Power as other spaces, but they used the ideas of Black Power and made it relative to Papua New Guinea, where Black Power, he said, was as old as the betel nut. The betel nut is a nut that's chewed like the kola nut in, in, in Africa. Uh, that was there before colonialism for the Black Power group. Black Power was a natural possession to getting what Papuans had, West Pap Papua New Guineans had lost because of colonialism. <clears throat> what made the space special is that as a university, they hosted uh, several what they call these Waigani seminars. And every year at the university, they addressed the issue of Melanesia. So one year it was politics in Melanesia, then it was economics culture, uh, environmental issues, land rights. And these are still continuing. But in the late 1960s into the early 1970s, these conferences and the university are drawing all kinds of black thinkers and thinkers from the global self, um, for, uh, in, including folks like Paulo Kamakafego, I mentioned, including leaders from the New Zealand Polynesian Panther Party, uh, to people like Joseph Benyakinen, who actually travels to Papua New Guinea to visit Paulu, who was working in uh, village development. And he actually writes a book called We All Look Alike, um, which argues that Black people in Papua New Guinea and the rest of the Black world looked alike. This is one of the, the lesser known books, I think, written by Joseph Benyakinen. But he writes that he only goes to Papua New Guinea because he's invited there by Paolo. Uh, in other words, Paolo is the one who puts Joseph Benyakinen on. Paolo was put on by other folks. Joseph Benyakinen also spreads an awareness of this activity. There's a much broader tradition. But these seminars were really, really critical, not just for the world, the Black world outside of Oceania, but within Oceania, it's creating a space of Black internationalism. And while Time Magazine, Life Magazine, anthropologists like Margaret Mead are telling us that Papua New Guinea is a land for time, a place of backwardness. For Black people in Oceania, Papua New Guinea is in the forefront. Papua New Guinea is the future. It has millions of people. It's a Black country. It's about to be independent. And it's defining itself as Black. For Australia, this is a concern. But for Black people in Australia, Papua New Guinea is the answer. It's part of the po a possible future. And so it becomes a site for insurgency to thinkers across the world. Now, this map will, will probably be helpful for us to think about Melanesia 
which stretches from Papua New Guinea, which is the largest country in Melanesia by far, um, the largest space in, in Polynesia. In other words, we can't even really talk about a Pacific or Polynesia without talking about Papua New Guinea excuse me, or Melanesia. Although if we were to believe popular media, this is the marginalized space and not the norm, but it's really just the opposite. So thinkers, activists, artists, writers, students, revolutionaries from West Papua all the way to Fiji and New Caledonia are going to Papua New Guinea to build community, to build networks, do the art, uh, the creating magazines, uh, the translating poetry and songs from indigenous languages into other languages. And it has a, it, the university creates this machine of publication and culture and art that I don't think we've really explored. In other words, when we think about a black arts movement um, as being connected to the black power movement in the United States, the Americas, Oceania has its own version of that. That is engaging the broader world. Um, these thinkers are studying Stokely Carmichael, Charles Hamilton's Black Power, the studying Sunyinka, the studying Achebe, the studying African thinkers, the studying Fanon, the studying different languages. If we don't engage Papua New Guinea as a space of Black arts movement, there's a tremendous gap in what we think we know. Once again, this is much further beyond um, we look alike. This is an older picture of Kev Walker who, in 1976, in Papua New Guinea asked a question, is it too much to hope that before long, the black artists in the Pacific will meet to celebrate in the black festival of arts? These independent writers conferences were really, really typical and really, really critical. Uh, this is Albert Wendt, a uh, major poet out of Samoa. If you look at the wall, this is actually the office of the Polynesian Panther Party. We see Guinea Bissau, Cape Verde. So Cabral is part of the discourses. We're out there solidarity against colonialism, neocolonial imperialism. This is a young Bobby Sykes, major black power activist in Australia. Literature from the Black Panthers, the United States, the Polynesian Panthers. This is what Oceania, this is what a black Pacific has to offer those concerned with the black world. And, and moving right along, I don't think I was, I don't want to spend too much more time. I want to take some questions. I also talk about uh, Fast Tech. Um, there's a, a delegation from Australia and Papua New Guinea that traveled to Fast Tech. Uh, as we know, the second world, Black and African, Fast Arts and Culture. Now, Papua New Guinea, as a government, would define itself as a Black country, which is why they, they send the delegation to Fast Tech. They made a conscious choice that we're gonna, we identify with the black world. Australia is just the opposite. Average people have to fight uh, Australia to allow them to go, uh, quote unquote. But this is a really critical moment. Uh, you know, some of the activists uh, I interviewed um, mentioned meeting folks like Stevie Wonder, uh, you know, meeting Fela, going to Fela Shrine, uh, being blown by the, the sea of the black world. Uh, they spent time in Ethiopia. They learned a lot. While we sometimes look at these festivals as spaces where politics don't take place or don't extend beyond the life of the conferences, this was not the case uh, for Fast Tech. Also Six Pack, obviously, obviously we know, um, uh, you know the Pan-African Congress that takes place in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam in 1974. There also was a contingent from Wanawatu that went. They were sent, or they were encouraged to come by Paulu once again. Uh, they were followed and surveilled closely by the French and the British, but they took these experiences back to Oceania with them in their own political struggles. Fiji, and each of these photographs represent a chapter in the book, uh, which loosely represents a particular country. So I, I, I discussed I think seven countries in Oceania, which was quite a bit. Uh, this is a photograph of a really critical activist named Amelia Ruka Tavuna, 
who is a leading radical thinker in Fiji. She was director of the Fiji's um, Young Women's Christian Association, the YWCA. She transformed it into a radical space of environmental justice, a space of the Nuclear Free Independent Pacific Conference. Her mentees, Vanessa Griffin and Kurt Slater, were heavily involved in ocean and Pacific struggles. Uh, because of Fiji's position geographically and also as a bridge between quote unquote Melanesia and Polynesia, it became a really critical site of radical organizing. Although we might look at Fiji as Fiji water or a place for tourism, we may not see it as a place for, for radicalism, we probably should. Uh, they organized the Pacific Women's Conference in 75 and also helped host the Nuclear Free Independent Pacific Conference, which was a major moment of uh, regional diversity and a pushback against European colonialism. They argued that countries like, like France and the United States tested nuclear bombs in the region because they were colonized by those spaces. So to be environmentally safe and healthy, to stop nuclear testing, they needed to be free politically. They produced this really amazing newspaper called Povai, which is a window into liberation movements across the region. Just one issue you will learn about reports from West Papua New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand, Timor, New Caledonia, which is still colonized by the French, Hawaii, New Hebrides, which is Vanuatu, Micronesia. In fact, this report from West Papua New Guinea actually came from uh, Carlos Moore, who was dispatched from Senegal by Leopold Senghor to find information about what was taking place in uh, West Papua. And he went pretty covertly. I know he gets a lot of flack for a stance on Castro in Cuba. I found his, his, his work in Oceania to be really um, interesting to say the like. Uh, this is a photograph of a, one activist from New Caledonia um, meeting leaders in Papua New Guinea. I'm sorry, Wanawatu. Uh, this is a photograph of a, a flyer, rather, of a sister, Susanna Winnie, who was a leader of the Kanak struggle. As I mentioned, they're still fighting against French colonialism. Uh, they traveled across the Black world. Uh, they were very much connected to the Black Francophone world. Uh, they studied in Paris. They read Fanon. Uh, they were connected with liberation movements in Martinique and Guadeloupe. On this trip, Susanna actually travels all across the United States. I'll just zoom in. She represented Canada women. They saw their experience in New Caledonia as linked to South Africa and apartheid. The trip was sponsored by the American Indian Movement, uh, the National Black Front. Uh, they traveled to Howard. I mean, she traveled to Howard. She did talks in DC. So in this moment, this is a flyer from Berkeley, California, but in this moment, this is 1985, the struggles are very visible, very visible. This, she spoke in the Blackburn Center, as a matter of fact. Audre Lorde talks about, at the same moment, Audre Lorde is actually in Australia, working with Black women, Kanak women, Korean women of Australia. And she talks about this when she comes back to the United States. This is a photograph of freedom fighters in New Caledonia. Uh, the French assassinate a number of the leaders. In their own struggle, they looked abroad for support. And ironically, they found help from uh, Gaddafi in Libya, who hosted one of the most critical independent uh, liberation conferences of Oceania um, that I've come across. Uh, this would be 1984, uh, but it's very rarely spoken of. And I talk about that in, 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 the book, in the book as well. Last but not least, uh, this is a photograph of Walter Linney, who was the leader of New Hebrides independence. He takes the country into independence. He helps transform, or they try to transform Wanawatu into a Cuba of Oceania. Uh, they sort of, they argued that very Nkrumah-like, if Wanawatu was free, it meant nothing. If other black struggles were still, um, going on. And so they made Wanawatu a safe space for freedom fighters from New Caledonia and also West Papua, who I was able to meet in my own travels uh, in the region. 
They very much saw themselves as a black space. This photograph from one of the, the liberation movement, the liberation uh, demonstrations, the sign says blacks must rule Wanawaku. They very clearly saw themselves as black people and lived in that space. And so in essence, the book engages a number of those themes. I've talked for quite too long. Hopefully uh, we have time for some, some conversation. Thanks for having me. Great, bro. Never too long to talk. <laughs> you're dropping you're dropping science man you're dropping some very important stuff man uh Thanks, bro. you know this this is an area where um we are really short when it comes to information we are at a low level when it comes to information coming out of uh the struggles and uh what what you're dropping on us regarding the the freedom fighters and and um their international connection with, with the continent of Africa, including Gaddafi. Um, you know, I, this is the first time I'm hearing that. But, um, you know, it, it means that uh, things are still happening because I understand that um, there have been some civil wars there. Uh, could you expand on it? it, it, it was, was this something to do with um, left and right or progressive and uh, colonial types or what, what was that? In Cal New Caledonia, I think was one of them. Yeah, um, New, New Caledonia is, is, a really, is, is really complicated. Um, they're colonized by the French. Uh, the French used New Caledonia like, a, like Britain used Australia as a, a penal colony. Mm. So they, they send convicts to New Caledonia. They give them land. Um, they give them rights. They also send freedom fighters from the Maghreb, from West Africa, Algeria, uh, Morocco, who fight against the French. They also send some of those political prisoners to New Caledonia. Um, but indigenous Caledonians are known as the Kenak, are not given rights. Um, in the late 1880s, there's a chief named Atai who approaches one of the regional generals and says, and they complain about the cattle of the French uh, settlers tramping on the traditional ground, the taro and things like that. And they wages war and they kill a, a major commander in the French army. And because of this, New Caledonia's freedom struggle is held in high esteem by the other liberal struggles because they kind of struck one of the the biggest blows for, for freedom. Um, it's not the same, but similar to Haiti, right? Not, not the same how we see Haiti as, you know, this site of black liberation, but the, res the response of Haiti's strike has been this persecution. Uh, so Haiti now is in a, a critical state controlled by, you know, former enslavers. New Caledonia, had struck one of the most critical blows for freedom, but they remain a colony. And if we, if that question had been asked in, in, in the Pacific in the 1960s, New Caledonia should have been first. They had one of the, the longest armed struggles, you know, at least that's the, kind of the, the framing. Um, but because of that, you know, France was committed to not losing New Caledonia. Um, and this is, they, they had this idea, they called it the New Caledonian, um, I'm, I'm butchering the word. They felt that if they lost New Caledonia, they, would, they could lose the other French colonies. Domino theory. In, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, they felt oh, that right. okay. Martinique and Guadeloupe might go next because they felt that these freedom fighters were learning from each other. Uh, and and they, were, they were inspiring each other. And so they really invested a ton of effort in destroying these various movements uh, through politics, through promises of, of you know, some form of sovereignty. So they don't call it a colony, these departments. And there's a really brutal case where they, I showed a photograph of, of a few young men around the table. Um, and the cover of the book is from New Caledonia. It's, it's a young girl being taught how to shoot a rifle. Mm -hmm. uh, that community is about to get attacked by French soldiers. 
they that community had captured um a french sergeant and some and some other french soldiers and they were holding them hostage in the cave and they said give us independence uh meanwhile the french they tortured these communities and villages to find out who these leaders were uh one of the leaders they took his father a priest uh they pretty much stripped them naked uh, electric shocked them in front of the whole community they put him on a plane to paris and made him stand up handcuff um all the way to paris and the son responded just really bad if they actually started to blame the other leaders and so uh two leaders are killed um assassinated uh also by white settlers who have been supported by the army and do the funeral for those two leaders well for that leader i should say um the son makes a speech at the funeral and he shoots the other two leaders oh and that 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 attack really set the, the movement back mm. For those from New Caledonia, they kind of never really recovered because it was such a blatant internal, external. I mean, we know we know Quintel Pro, right? So this is this is this is Quintel Pro on steroids, and like the, the 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 impact of that, in the midst of also promising freedom. So, folks were politically in prison. There's a poet, Dua Gorde, who spent several times in prison. Um, and they also made promises on different islands. So, so the, 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 broad, the broad statement is, yes, there is a form of, I wouldn't say necessarily civil war, but there's definitely really issues of strife in that, in that struggle. Um, Bougainville definitely was at the moment of civil war, uh, without, without question. Um, they also, also fought a major environmental war that, against Papua New Guinea. Um, but really was against Australia, um, if we really, or Australian, Australian foreign capital. Um, so I think across the region, what, what the, the period I study, there's much more uni, unified um, pushes for freedom. But decades later, uh, the region's facing some of the same struggles that we see Africa or we see the Caribbean having gone through um, from those initial moments of political independence. You know, we'll, we'll far cry from those, from those days. Okay. Uh, questions from anybody? Well, I don't have a question per se. Uh, I'm just impressed. I was texting you just now, man. It's good to see you, by mm. the way. Man. It's excellent to see you. Uh, yes, and I, see, I see you. You ain't let up, man. You know, you ain't let up a bit. You speak the truth to power. Yeah. We need that. Uh, I guess my biggest question would be, first of all, you know, the, the, the UNIA is at the, is at the point now of rebuilding uh, what I call blacktricity, but actually raising the consciousness of those that come behind us of mm. our great past. And the information you're sharing, man, is critical for us to figure out ways and means of getting it out to those young brothers and sisters, wherever they are on the planet, that are serious about continuing the movement. Because right. for real, for real, we know colonialism, neocolonialism, the Berlin Conference, transatlantic slave trade, the attacks of all our political prisoners from our prisoner, our brothers and sisters from Lumumba uh, to Malcolm. I mean, all of that is relevant to keeping us divided. And so right. we know to, to kick back against that, we need to figure out ways and means of not allowing the same Cointel Pro, call it whatever you want. Of, uh, of, of discouraging and keeping us divided. So what I would say to you, first of all, I got to get your book, your new book. Yes, sir. But, uh, but Baba Mosi, uh, I've known my brother for a while and every time I've heard him present, it's, it's, it's eye-opening. So I'm like you, Baba Mosi. I learned a great deal in this little time. And even though I'm down in North Carolina working with some young girls with this camp right now, I couldn't miss this one. So I'm going to just yield mm. back. And I know others that are on here probably have some key questions for you too, bro. But keep up the great work. And let's, let's, 
let's, I mean, even though it's not a Freedom Friday, let's figure out a ways and means of how we in the UNIA, regardless of where we are, can help you get this information, even to people who may not get your book. Because yes, you need to wake people up to the real deal of the movement. And, and, and you dropped some real serious uh, stuff that we need to, 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 to really be clear on. And now that our traveling ambassador, Brother Renoko Rashidi, who is still our traveling ambassador, he used to wake us up right. on a lot of levels. But you know, it's true that you, you, you're doing the work as well. And we got a lot of brothers that are still above dirt doing the great work. So we need to figure out ways and means of how we can support you and to advance the work that you're doing so that we can come off better in the future. So Baba Mosi, I yield. No question. Just keep up the good work, brother. We with you. We got your back. Let us know, you know, the UNI, how we can be more supportive of the work you're doing because it's critical that I'll well, you know, well, well, Baba, I appreciate it. And I just, just want to say that, you know, it, it's, 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 it's the UNI, it's, it's spaces like this, it's brothers like you who I'm, I'm a part of this, this tradition too. And part of that is for me, when I come back to my community, I have to bring it. I have to bring something new. I have to have went to another level. I have to have broke through some barriers. Otherwise, what do I have to offer? You know, what do I have to offer to, to offer something to a UNIA division? <laughs> you got to bring it, right? Because it's like, you know, you all have held us down for so long. And that consistency matters. So for me, um, I'm, I'm thinking about our work whenever I do, whenever I do my work. Like, oh, this can be useful. This is something. So, but I think the the the, the question of the, the the getting the information out, I have I have a ton of photographs, videos, a lot of stuff doesn't make the book. There's a lot more. There's a lot art, uh, poetry, um, visual art, uh, you know, cosmology systems, ways of thinking of the environment um solar power deities ancestor reverence there's a lot in this space that we could we could engage so you know i'm i'm back and forth in dc um so uh, you know I'll, I'll i'll do my best to be as available as possible um although I, you know i do sometimes i'm like i'm like midnight <laughs> yeah i have a question <laughs> okay uh anyone a question? Else? yes mm -hmm. The question I have, have you ever given a thought in terms of other historians of Korean like a knowledge expert system where you could put together some of these linkages together in a some type of system that the children can access or ask questions of using like AI? Uh, could you, I mean, it sounds really interesting what you're saying. Could you be just, what would that look like um, from, from your saying, perspective? It's a possible, if, if you were thinking about Creating like a database of the different the data points in terms of using some right. standard adjective, noun, verbs, with some type of like um, look as a social studies framework. So you can put together some type of, of a learning system where you could put together the different commonalities of history mark, markers, as, mm. well as, as well as tie together some of this stuff with access. If he was um, in terms of like a history AI interface, no, I think I think that I think that would be great. Um, I know I, I think I've been spending my time uh, building building my archive, and trying to make it a, that as accessible as possible. But I think I think what you're describing is really important work. Um, that excuse me, I don't think I would want to do as an individual. But maybe as as part of a, a collective or a team of folks who have have some of those technical backgrounds. Um, I mean, I'm very comfortable with technology, um, but I also have a lot of content. Right. Um, so for me, I think projects like that, I think, is are, are, are critical. I, I would be open to doing it. Without question. Um, the reason I ask the question because I I noticed that that's what's going on in the majors in the major, quote unquote, these some of these IT companies in these um right knowledge management companies is that they, they're creating like a European framework. But the thing about it is if you don't have our own African presence, then the, 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 the psychology of learning becomes Eurocentric. And, and that's another way that you could do like, you know, colonialism in terms of, of put it on automatic control, cruise control. Right, right, right. Thanks for the comment. Thanks for the comment and question. 
Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Uh, Who is this? It's Rafiki. Ah! Rafiki. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, man. How you Africans I'm doing? Rafiki. Ready for the right, revolution, bro. Right. <laughs> Ready for the revolution. That's right. Um, yeah, this is uh, uh, extremely interesting. Um, we've been a long time um, talking about the uh, Africans um, east of Africa. And, and it really, I, I personally have been, have been doing some studies. Uh, uh, people need to pay a lot of attention to the uh, work of Diop because he um, laid it out really clearly that all of that area of the world was occupied by Africans. In fact, he says that um, there was no such thing as a white person 21,000 years ago. And we know that the planet had been occupied um, all the way to the Western parts of the planet uh, at least 50 to 100,000 years ago and many parts of the world millions of years ago. So um, it, it is a black planet. And um, the ugly part about that is, the, uh, is that these Europeans are our illegitimate children. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I know we don't want to claim them, but that's the reality. They couldn't have come from nowhere else. There ain't no other people on the planet. Uh, well, it's but, um, the truth to power, Rafiki. You tell the truth, man. We need but I, I do. If if I do, I do want to just 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 jump in with that. I think for me, what I'm interested in is the 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 how. Like I'm really interested in the process of of learning. So just as you know, I wasn't. I wouldn't just fall in Oceania, right? I, I'm, I'm an interested in Jop and, and like, it's Jop's in Paris. At what point does Jop meet other indigenous folks from the French colonial world in Oceania? And if, if we back up, that's also a tradition. When Amy yeah. Cesar writes a discourse on colonialism, he talks about Tahiti. He talks about the French colonial world, uh, Ho Chi Minh, talks about, you know, oppression in Senegal, oppression in Tahiti, uh, Jane and uh, Paulette Nadal, they critique Josephine Baker for playing a Tahitian indigenous person mm -hmm. in a problematic way. Uh, their, their journals around, you know, decolonization, they're talking about Oceania. Jop is, and President's African, uh, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's publishing some of these writers from New Caledonia, and there was one priest, his name was Apollonia, because just as the Black Rover ended up in, in London, you know, like everybody's, all the French colonial folks are gonna be in, in Paris. Um, there was a dissertation that was written by a New Caledonia, a Kenak uh, priest, which was about black culture, um, that was gonna be published by President African and Jop, but that priest dies. Um, it still gets released and it, it becomes one of the, like the philosophical, I guess, um, inspirations for the Black Farm Movement, in New Caledonia. But, you know, I'm excited that you mentioned Jop because Jop is part of that. He also has this direct contact with folks. Really what I'm saying is that, that's what I'm intrigued by, that, that direct contact. He knows some of these folks by name and by work. I think, I think it's really exciting. Well, what I wanted to try to um, query, or at least add to the conversation, because I mean, what you've done, at least for me, is, is, is drawn a picture of the universal nature of the struggle of Africans on the planet, it's especially in this modern context of the colonial era and the neo-colonial emergence that has swept the world. Um, and in keeping with that reality, you know, um, this militarization of capitalism and imperialism, the extension of the US Pacific Command, 
in league with the African Command and the Central Command, um, the activities of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, you know, when we look at Africa, when we look at the US, when we look at Europe and other places in the world, we see the commonality of this imperialist enterprise and the methods that they use. And, uh, and now they have this, uh, what they call it, a pivot, <laughs> a pivot to, um, to Asia. And I was wondering to what extent um, the struggle that is going on now is consciously aware of these kinds of modern linkages, um, the, the spreading of the US Africa Command um, to, to the US Pacific Command. How do these factors now, because I, I, I mean, I know they still have a colonial situation, but these are neo-colonial mechanisms that are being used to perpetuate that situation. And I wanted to see if you could give me some understanding of how the people in the area view imperialism and the anti-imperialist struggle, uh, particularly in relationship to these military uh, kind of efforts that imperialism is engaging in right now. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's a great, um, a great, a, a really broad question. Um, it's also historic too. So for those who know my earlier work, um, my, my first book on black power in Bermuda, and actually the second book, Paulus Diaspora, I studied surveillance of global black power struggles. And so for me, part of my research methodology is mining some of those, um, you know, the view from the state. And so, you know, I've come across some really interesting US military and CIA documents that talked about security problems um, in Oceania. This is around World War II. This is also 1960s. They reevaluate. And they were concerned about how independent struggles would impact the plans to militarize the region and the thinking decades down the road. Mm -hmm. um, they also realized that they needed to militarize other fields like anthropology to help them in preparing or help them study indigenous communities so that they could extract what they want from these communities in the most effective ways. Right. So Margaret Mead's career, um, it's, it's partly based upon her work for the military government, for the US government, who funds her work. Um, and she's very, she's very, you know, she knows what she's doing. Um, and there's a black feminist anthropologist who passed away, and her name is Angela Gilliam. She did a lot of work in countering Margaret Mead's or exposing what Margaret Mead was about. Um, so for example, when Margaret Mead is, is you know, her, her work is based upon saying all kind of mystical, <laughs> incorrect perceptions of black people, indigenous people in Papua New Guinea. She actually runs into some of these students from the New Guinea Black Power Group who challenge her ideas and say, wait a minute, that's not what my grandfather said. That's not my grandmother, that's not my community. Um, but the voices are really much silence. Um, so, but to fast forward, there's extensive campaigns used by the US military, as well as, as France, Australia, uh, to control the region. France and NATO. Britain. Fr sorry? I said NATO. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, 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 other, and, other, and other versions of that, right? Other, other yeah. Pacific versions of that. A lot of it circulated around the question of nuclear testing. And um, because with the US control in Guam, uh, placed it in Micronesia, uh, while we look at the bombing of Hiroshima as like the ending, 
because it ends World War II, quote unquote. It's the beginning. The U.S. drops over 500 more atomic bombs in Micronesia after that. So the, the notion of the Hiroshima's the bomb and it's over is really a facade. So, so by in the 1960s, 1970s, what I think is really amazing is how activists and groups from not just Melanesia or what's called Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia, they're meeting to address these military issues, which are connecting to the issues of nuclear testing, the connect to the issues of colonialism, health. Uh, they know they're being studied in a way that doesn't respect who they, represent who they are. They, they, there is an understanding. There's a clear understanding um, of what's taking place. And I think for the younger generations, I think they're starting to revisit and re-understand what these elders were talking about in the 1970s, 80s, because in the 70s, they were talking about the sea levels rising. Now those sea levels have risen. So the elders aren't crazy, quote unquote. Like it, it's, it's, it's obvious that there has to be this engagement. So I think for Oceania, I think, I think it's a clear, I think it's a clear, a clear, and I, I'm, I'm not saying that, okay, everything that's militarily done, there's, there's the awareness, but there's a critical mass organizers who know, know how global this thing is. Um, but it's also a really diverse space. And, you know, most of my time was in Wanawatu and Fiji. And I, I met several organizers who were trying to go back to indigenous forms of currency, indigenous ways of knowing, food ways. Uh, they were trying to separate themselves from, you know, what was taking place globally. Um, there were students at the University of South Pacific who couldn't find jobs, but they were actively working around solar power and indigenous technologies. Uh, Australia is a different landscape because black deaths by police custody is one of the leading cause of death for black people in Australia. So there are these diverse day-to-day -day issues. They're not all the same, but I think there is this interesting internationalist idea or understanding of the Pacific as a whole, um, much more than I think some of the nationalist stuff, nationalist space. When I say nationalist, I mean U.S. European created nation state dynamics, I think, that we fight with in the Americas. I want to say it's less than that in, in the region for the folks I work with, but I, I could be corrected as well. But that's, that's, that was my perception. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. If uh, nobody else is, has a oh, question, okay. let me... One more quick thing. What do you see as um, the future in terms of the, the linkages of these struggles in Africa, in the West, and in the East? What, what do you see uh, that can come about to create a really kind of internationalist solidarity around those common threads? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, I think it I, for me, I think a practical space would be, I mentioned the term of the thinking of a black Pacific before. And if, if you think of a black Pacific, right? A black Pacific for me is not just black people in Melanesia, it's black people in Colombia, that's right. Um, we, we see what just took place with the elections in Colombia. And obviously, you know, we know how these things work. Um, but Colombia has a strong, you know, tradition of maroonage and black liberation struggles. Uh, we could have, we could really, we could think the black population in Panama, Costa Rica, uh, that that's part of a black Pacific, Mexico, United States, California mm -hmm. could be seen as a part of a black Pacific as well. Uh, and, if, and if you think more about the framings now going west of the United States, obviously there's China, there's Asia, there's, there's Micronesia, there's another thinking that connects us to the Indian Ocean. And that's a, I think some of the connections of Oceania are coming across the Indian Ocean. 
and not just out of the Atlantic. For example, Diego Garcia, um, when activists were talking about the militarization of the Marshall Islands, they're also talking about Diego Garcia. As, as a matter of fact, I think when we think of Pan-Africanism, so many of these critical moments take place on the Indian Ocean. The Sixth Pan-African Congress, sure. Tanzania, that's, that's Indian Ocean. Uh, South Africa is also Indian Ocean. Uh, Mozambique and Free Limo actually had some serious connections with East Timor and freedom fighters, other West Papua. I think, I think there's historic connections, but some of them are also contemporary. I, I think some of that, some of these connections, it has to be intentional work done by how these regions see themselves. Um, can East Africa imagine itself in connection with a Wanawatu? Because, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this quote, um, because I think for me, Wanawatu was independent in 1981, which, and I'm not, I don't want to glorify it, but in many ways, uh, they had the, the unfortunate ability to see some of the pitfalls of these other struggles and to craft a global vision. As I mentioned, they saw themselves as a Cuba of Oceania. They embraced Pan-Africanism. They incorporated red, black, and green in the flag. They created a group called the Melanesian Spearhead Group for Melanesian states. Like those, those are intentional forms of, of, of black internationalism. But I just wanna read really quickly, if I may, uh, one of the president, of, the first president of Wanawatu statement to the United Nations. Um, and I, I think this, this for me surmises the point. This is 1983. He began by recognizing the independence of St. Christopher and Nevis, which in the Caribbean, which he called assist a small island state. Then he described liberation movements across Africa, Asia, South Central America, the Caribbean and Oceania, and he cited Frederick Douglass. Power can seize nothing about the demand. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. He asked that these words be part of the UN's deliberations. He said, after so many years, it's not easy to understand why the people of Palestine cannot return home. He said it was difficult to understand why South Africa needed more inducements to end its illegal occupation in Namibia. He said that he admired Indonesia as a friend, but a true friend is not one who just tells the other what they want to hear. So he challenged Indonesia's aggression against East Timor. What East Timor threatened Indonesia that hundreds of thousands of innocent men and women and children had to pay for their lives. Where was it written that colonialism was only wrong when the colonial power was a European nation? And then he said, if we accept Indonesia, then how could we challenge Israel's annexation of Jerusalem or apartheid in South Africa? He said that he was brought to these conclusions through the words of Amakur Cabral and Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau struggle. Hide nothing from the masses of the people, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. For him, this was relevant also in New Caledonia, Namibia, and South Africa. New Caledonia was the world's largest producer of nickel and his resources were exploited just as in Africa. He referenced how Wanawatu had hosted the Nuclear Free Independent Pacific Conference in 83, saying that the people of the Pacific had always respected and been at peace with the environment. And to them that land, the skies, the ocean had always been a source of spiritual guidance as well as sustaining life. And the connections between sovereignty and nuclear freedom were clear. Um, he decried how, you know, the, the shooting down of a civilian aircraft, the current airlines flight 007 by the Soviet Union was a great tragedy. And he extended his condolences to the victims of those families, the families of the victims. But he's still oppressed. He said, but we were the same persons who were silent when the Libyan airliner was shot down by Israel fighters. And when a Cuban airline was shot down, where were they when that happened? Wasn't all life sacred? The lives of the Vietnamese, East Timorese, Palestinians, Lebanese, Iranians, Iraqis, Chileans, Filipinos, Guatemalans, Angolans, Namibians are all sacred. So for those who were willing to isolate Soviet Union, why were they not so unwilling to isolate South Africa? And 
I'll, I'll leave it at that. But that's the, for me, that's the kind that kind of vision, that kind of thinking from Oceania, from a, from a place that's supposed to have not been identified with the black world. Um, that's the kind of vision I think we still need globally. So when we think of the Pan African thinkers of the world, we should say names like Walter Linney and Huda Linney. Like we should know that we should know that statement. And when I and when I teach in my classes, I I, mean, I use that because it's such a comprehensive but succinct vision of Pan Africanism for the world we find ourselves in. Um, and I, I'll, I'll I'll end with that. Uh, thank you. You know. <laughs> This all present day, what was mentioned, present day, the similarities are there when it comes to NATO. Right. You know, exceptionalism of NATO or NATO countries. They can they can bomb, they can strafe, they can send their terrorists to bomb planes and all, and they don't get sanctioned. But then they pick on those countries who, uh, right. you know, when they come together, it's, you know, it's all about their capital. If they're going to be losing any uh, um, control, or there's a, there's a sign of a, some backwardness where they're concerned, um, they're ready, and <laughs> they even if. It's a war, and somebody else is going to die, like they're doing with the Ukrainians. Right. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, you also mentioned that you know, okay, we 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 aren't paying attention to what the people of the Africans or Black folks of the Pacific are saying, and uh, they're not saying anything different. And and we do need to be linking more with yeah. these people in in uh, in in the struggles. Um, you, you know, and, and they, they, I, you know, from what you, you mean, you mentioned something in the book, um, some experience you've had with, uh, with, with, I think it's in Vanuatu, someone who clearly understands the connection between mm. Vanuatu and Africa, and and what is it? What is it called? The landing or? Oh, first landing. Like, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Elaborate on that a little bit if you can. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, by the time I, I, I traveled to Oceania in 2014, and by the time I went, you know, I had, um, like I mentioned, you know, Paulo Camera Figo told me a lot about Black people in Guanajuato. I went to Guanajuato because he was there, or he had been there. You know, I had been to several Renuka Rashidi lectures. I had a sense of there's a, a black presence in Oceania. I still wasn't prepared for what I would experience. Uh, I was in Wanawatu and um, I was staying in a village known as Mele Village. No, I was in Fiji, sorry. I was in Fiji and I wanted to sail to Wanawatu. Um, and I was going to take a cruise ship. Captain Cruise, the Captain Cook cruise ship line. And two of my friends from Tonga said, wait a minute, are you crazy, Quito? They said, that's 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 the Christopher Columbus, Oceania. You can't take Captain Cook cruise line. It's gonna mess up your vibes. You should go to a yacht club and say you'll be a deckhand and you could sail like we once did. Mind you, this couple had never sailed across to one water themselves, but they inspired me to do so. So I went. To a yacht club, I wrote us put up a sign said I'll be a deckhand. An Australian captain called me that night. We left a few days later. Me and his captain on a boat. He told it to take three days. The boat broke down the first day. The engine was just broke, and so we were just. It felt remote to me I'm on a boat. Boats just sailing, not really going. We're not making any progress, as far as I was concerned. Uh, so we kept stopping at marinas. And we finally get to Marina that was called First Landing. I said, oh, that's an interesting name. It's summer. For me, it's summer off the coast of Fiji. It's not really summer. It's, it's, it's a real location. People do live there. And I got off the boat. Everybody looked like me, which is typical for Fiji. And I said, wow, where am I? And I was talking to the security guard. I said, oh, this is First Landing. I said, oh, that's a 
interesting name. Why, why is it first landed? He said, well, this is for our ancestors first landed from Africa, from Tanganyika, you know, Tanzania. I said, for real? And then I, I, that's when I took my camera out and I had to ask him, can you just say that again? Act like it's the first time I asked you. Uh, but that's when I knew that for me, that was striking because this wasn't a professor at a university. This wasn't a librarian. This wasn't somebody who, quote unquote, quote unquote, is supposed to be <coughs> learned. Uh, this brother worked at a, at, at, a, at, a, at a marina, but he had a clear sense of Africa. And so while I was doing this other book on Paolo, I, I knew that I wanted to follow to see what this African thought or what Africa meant to uh, folks across the region. And I was, I was blown to have found much more, but much of that was not intentional. That was some Elegba, Maui energy taking place. I was not intending to go to first landing at all. And I told the captain goodbye, left him in his boat, and I took a flight to Mentor One watch him. And I wished him well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, look, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's an experience. <laughs> But and I like I like sailing. I like I like I like I'm from the real. I like, but still. Well, on, yeah, man. that's true too. You, you said three yeah. days, and I was that's like five it's days. On, it's not unfamiliar. That's right. it. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I have another question, and uh, you know, time is going, and and we we've uh, we've uh, gone past the, the promised ninety minutes. Um, you use the term black in, uh, black internationalism. Mm -hmm. and and then there's pan-africanism and uh how should we look at this uh, are there is there any clue i mean let's analyze that as a or or let let you analyze that for us i mean in the sense of in using these terms where is the, where is there a similarity or difference right uh well i, I would say i identify myself as a pan-africanist without, without question um, I, I think very much like Peter Tosh, as long as you're a black man, no matter you come from, you're African. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, but I think for me, sometimes black internationalism might be useful when we think of ways in which black people might have thought of themselves internationally. Uh, Africa is not always the first question. Uh, it may be part of the question, not the first question. So, for example, you know, when we think about um, other connections with the global self or the broader global self. In other words, Africa's connection to indigenous populations of South America's, India, Asia, uh, is it always to a Pan-Africanist lens? Um, I don't think it has to be, but I also don't think it's necessarily an antithesis to Pan-Africanism. I think there's some, there's some space in between. I think sometimes our internationalism might not always be directly, overtly political, but there may be some international connections culturally that are just there. Um, I think Pan-Africanism is a form of black internationalism. I think black power is a form of black internationalism, but probably more so than anything, I also use black internationalism because it's a term that's created by, uh, I mentioned it earlier, um tonight um uh jane adol who was from martinique her and her sister uh paulette nadal opened a salon in paris in the 1930s 1920s rather they also launched a newspaper uh called dispatches african where they denounced colonialism um, she used the term black internationalism to describe an emerging movement of, of black thinkers uh, across the world who will rise up and study the black world. And so part of me using black internationalism is also uh, an ode to saying there are other forms that we've thought about the black world. And I think many times our conversations are too male dominated when we think about the black world. So I like to speak of black internationalism because for me, I'm also invoking a black woman from Martinique who actually was one of the, the pioneers of negritude. Uh, you know, before Cesar, um, Dumas and Senor, 
the adults and other other black women in the black francophone world are actually doing that kind of work that negative is going to do so that's that's how i i see black internationalism although i think some might think that black international means is this an academic way to avoid saying pan-africanism um i certainly don't think so um but i can see why others might 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 think that but that's not how I, I tend to perceive black internationals. Professor. Yes. Yes, Baba Mose. yes Brother Patrick. Uh, I would like to interject with your permission. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, sir, go oh, ahead. I don't know if my permission though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very pointed, nonlinear concept. Much respect, my young brother. <laughs> but that, that concept also emerged also with Sylvia Winter. That's why I come in. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. That's why I interject as a student, you know? Yes, respect, respect, All right. respect, respect. <laughs> but uh, you're very thorough. I ran into your name years ago by a good brother. John Cromwell, I don't know if you remember that brother, hmm. but uh, think about it. <laughs> All right. You said Very John, good, man. Very John, thorough. John Cromwell? Yeah, yeah, John Cromwell. All oh, right. Now you got my brain working. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, 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 I had a, something. You know, time has, um, you know, yeah. Let, let me, let me uh, try to bring this to a close. Uh, I must say, my brother, I appreciate uh, you taking the time out to be with us this evening and uh, expounding on your travels and uh, experiences and uh, and the accumulation of data to. To, to have an archive to the point where uh, you will, I am, I'm sure, be having uh, some other books. You, there are some people who are writing tons of books these days and um, professors too. I don't know if you have, if you have, the, if you have the help they have in, in doing this kind of research work, but uh, you know what, from what you've said, it seems like we've got a few books coming ahead. So, uh, so, so, thank you for giving us the heads up. Yeah, I have, I have a, the, ne the next piece. I'll just, I don't mind saying it. it it's it's going to be about uh, the insurgent, black global insurgency in the eighties and nineties uh -huh. through sound system culture and reggae and dancehall. Okay. That that that's that's what that's what's next. That's, that's what's, what's next. next. Yeah. All right. Well, Dennis Brown. Dennis Brown is going to meet people like Bone to Killer. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, you heard it first here on Freedom Friday Forum. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, Dr. Tito Swan is going to be bringing out another tone for you, and you, you know, hey, and uh, we, we, we are, we, we, we waiting with in in bated breath here because uh, let, listen, let me show it again. Let me bring this forward again. His book. Pacific of Black, you need to read it so you can understand a lot more of what he, he did not go deep. I mean, this is deep stuff. He, he tried to give you, uh, you know, the first paragraph of, of, each, of, each, uh, of each page <laughs> in what he had said. But um, it's a good book. From what I, I've skimmed through, because I couldn't get to read it in time for this, but uh, I, but I, I had some more questions, and and I, but um, that might lead us into uh, nine o'clock, if you don't mind. Uh, well, that, the question would be, um, uh, as you call them, the uh, the um, oh man. Uh, well, you're speaking about the the earlier researchers, black, and uh, and one of them uses is uh, Dr. Harris. It was. It's Joseph Harris, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
it seems that uh, some some of what he came up with is that um, we should not look at because there are Africans everywhere in this historical way. We should not look at it as you know. Um, the, the world has always been black or something like that. I, 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 I may be misunderstanding what you, but I think you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, clear that up for me if you can, please. Well, I, I think what I was drawing from him is his notion of the African diaspora is it doesn't start with the Atlantic slave trade. Hmm. While, while we can't deny the, the significance of the Atlantic slave trade in the modern world and its impact on Black people, where Black people are now, African diaspora as, as, as a history, as, as was mentioned before, starts before Europe's even an idea. The question of African world is, 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 is much older. Uh, that's in Asia. And there were different cycles of diasporas. Hmm. Um, so that's pretty much what I was trying to invoke because part of it is now, you know, folks will say that the new way, the new wave of looking at the African diaspora is looking at Africa in the Middle East. Uh, but Harris, that's not that's that's not really new. It's it's maybe a return to a discussion, but the notion of the Black Atlantic as the way we think of the Black world, we've thought beyond that historically. As, as, as African people. And quite frankly, now uh, there were studies, you know, just to go back to Pacific, some DNA studies that show that some of the individuals who first left Africa show the same DNA of, as of Aboriginal Australians who literally walked into Australia before there was water before Papua New Guinea, between Papua New Guinea and Australia. So these are much older conversations. Uh, that's not my, that's not my, 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 you know, that's not my bag. You know, I, I know to an extent there's an anthropologists who talk about Lapita culture and ways from 4,000 years and how they've traced pottery across Wanawatu to the Solomons that end up in Hawaii and New Zealand that are unpacking what it means to be Polynesian because white folks, of course, you know, if you can sail, you must be white or some lost white tribe, the same sort of set of Africa. So they've convinced the world that Polynesians are advanced and Melanesians are backwards. The anthropologists are unpacking that, you know, step by step, dig by dig. Um, so some of this, all those kind of earlier questions are, are, are different discussions, but it doesn't take away from the impact of the land slave trade or the Arab slave trade of African people. But our diaspora is even beyond that. So. You know, um, that's uh, for me, that's what Harris makes us think about. Um, but what we do in our practical lives is another, another matter of how, how we, you know, the challenges we face in this world um, sometimes take priorities in how we think about ourselves historically as well. So that's Harris for me. That's <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, thank, thank you. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's not within your scope. And we can leave that for there. Are so many students out there, they got lots of work to do. They can go out there and and and, and dig a little more or try to challenge yes. what Harris said, with whatever it is. You know, we we still got room to, to maneuver. <laughs> right, right. And bringing right, out our history. Right, so right. um yeah, okay. Well, once again, let me let me uh tell you again. Okay, folks, I, you know, I, I listen, this is my brother, and and I, I, I want you to understand this he did he this is not an easy job. You know, I mean, it took work to put this book together and it's a lot of good information. Every one of us should have a copy of this book and we should uh, uh, spread the news that uh, there's a book out here that will make us understand a lot better what uh, about the people of Oceania or, or the Pacific Black as he, as he terms them. And, um, you know, it will, it will be for us to get a, an understanding, the link more with us. West Papua, for instance, is a, is a place, you know, at this point in time that uh, we focus a lot on because of, you know, what is happening in, in, with the Indonesian imperialism. And, um, and so I, I thank you for, for coming and giving us, you know, your point of view of, um, or, you know, your, your experience, relating your experiences to us in this, in this great book. I, I thank you very much, my brother. Uh, peace to you, and I hope we can have you on again. In uh, at the end of November, we're going to be having a forum on West Papua. 
uh, which which this this we are engaging this because of the first of December and and the relationship with the the, the invasion by the Indonesians and all that we generally have a and this has been going on for the last couple of years we generally have a a forum on the rest of Papua on the last Friday the fourth Friday of November hopefully it's not going to clash with anything somebody's holiday you know but um, if if you if you're available then. Uh, you know, I would sure would like to have you on because uh, we're going to be having uh, a couple of brothers from uh, our sisters from West Papua who are in the um, the, the um, freedom movement over there. Okay, so so I, again, my brother, uh, it's sure, good having in. you, and I'm I'm sure that my promise to folks that uh, you know this it's not going to be a, a dull moment here this evening. And uh, it certainly would not. And uh, <clears throat> see you again when you, well, let's hope we see you before even November. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. There may be something that uh, will, that uh, topical about that area in the news. For instance, now we, you know, the US is talking about, uh, or Australia is talking about making threats towards those areas, the people there and all that because of the Chinese and all that. They're going, they're, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more issues with our black folks in the Pacific that we may need to discuss. And we'd love to have you on if you're available to do that. Thank all you, right, Baba. Okay. Thanks, thanks to the thank audience. You, thank you care. very much again. Uh, thank you, folks. Thank you for being on this Freedom Friday. Uh, the next Freedom Friday will be, I think, the 22nd. Of, uh, of this month um, and um, we will let you know then uh, what what the topical issue will be it, it certainly would be a topical issue we we, we, we want to be dealing with the, the issue of Colombia something uh, you muted Baba. yes the, the issues of, uh, of, of violence, um, you know, this gun culture we're living in, um, if, we, if we can put that together, it's, it's just too much. All right, uh, everyone, I will see you next time. Good night. Goodbye. Godspeed. Good night, Good night, Africans. All right. Brother Heru, you can take us out. <clears throat> All right.